The years leading up to World War I were eventful for Texas A&M. In 1916, with a world war looming over the nation, cadets abandoned the traditional gray uniforms and adopted the now familiar khaki and olive. Standard Army training began on campus and Texas A&M added courses in radio operation, aircraft maintenance, and truck driving, skills badly needed by the armed forces. In 1917, almost all of the senior class had gone to Army training. So President Bazell and the Board of Directors conferred diplomas in the shade of an oak tree at the cadets training camp near San Antonio. During World War I, Texas A&M provided a larger percentage of its men to the Army than any other college in the country. At least 55 gave their lives. Following World War I, Texas A&M, like the rest of the nation, loosened up a bit. The Roaring Twenties brought a multitude of new students to the college. By 1923, a third of all college-bound Texas high school graduates went to Texas A&M. By 1931, the automobile revolution was so dramatic that the campus literally changed directions. After Texas A&M supported the creation of Highway 6, now known as Texas Avenue, officials changed the main entrance away from the familiar railroad tracks and turned the campus to face east. The Roaring Twenties came to a crashing end with the onset of the Great Depression. Times were tough all over, but surprisingly, enrollment at A&M went up instead of down. In the 1930s, oil discoveries on college-owned lands brought funding for many new features on campus. During these lean years, A&M was able to build a number of the more impressive yet characteristic buildings that still exist on campus today. In October of 1938, the area around the campus had grown enough to incorporate a new city. College Station became the answer to a vastly growing student body that required matching faculty and support. This time we have a little something special, the essence of the Aggie spirit we've been talking about, the refusal to put on airs a downright American earthiness. It's a song written by an Aggie like the A&M songs. The composer, Jack Littleton, used to direct the campus dance band. He tried to describe in swing tempo how it feels to be an Aggie, and it must feel pretty good. I'd rather be a Texas Aggie. In 1931, Texas A&M found its first lady. Aggie lore is wide and varied about how this special dog found her way to campus. But by all accounts, she found a home here. Over 30 people claim, in nearly a dozen different stories, to have had a hand in discovering the Texas A&M mascot, but all agree that once she was here, the cadets adopted her and she them. Reveille was known to seek out lonely or unhappy boys and follow them around until they agreed to play a game of fetch. Each morning, the mixed breed matron of the AMC would bark to the playing of Reveille on the bugle. In one account, she was thrown out of the mess hall by a waiter until four cadets threw the waiter out and let the dog back in. So intense was the respect of the cadets that when Rev. 1 died in 1944, she received a full military funeral. A new mascot would not come to Texas A&M until 1952. Today, Company E-2 of the Corps of Cadets is charged with the care of Reveille, but she is still very much an all-campus mascot. She attends classes and is never too busy to stop and pose for a few photos. The tradition of Reveille is about a boy and his dog, a loyal friend through thick and thin, a companion to lift us up and move us on. By 1941, Texas A&M's enrollment was about 6,500. Students were attending class and graduating in record numbers. The school had awarded its first PhD, and the battalion was a mainstay communication that offered a unique reflection of America at the time. A few years earlier, in 1937, President Franklin Roosevelt visited the campus. At Kyle Field, he told the Aggies to train hard and be prepared. Now war was on the horizon once again. By the time the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, over half of all living graduates of Texas A&M were reserve military officers. And I was coming out of Guyon Hall and on the military walk going back to uh, to my hole, and uh, they, uh, everybody was coming down and said, they just bombed Pearl Harbor. We had no idea where Pearl Harbor was. They did what? Who did what? And the word was spreading across the campus. 
In 1942, virtually everyone on campus was called to war. Only those too young or physically unable to fight were left behind. I was the class of 44, and the, that class and the class of 45 were all marched down to the depot together, and caught trains, and we left together. We left on March 23rd of 1943, and what uh, the Army did, they, they sent us to several Army camps, took those Aggie uniforms off of us, and put real Army uniforms on us, and processed us, gave us Army serial numbers, put us back on the train and sent us back to College Station. Came back uh, and things were different. There was an Army first sergeant standing at the door. I mean, a you know, big, tough looking guy and a captain. And we were under the thumbs of a captain and a first sergeant for the rest of that semester. Things were different. But we finished the semester and the first week of June then, we went back to the uh, depot again, got on the train. This time it was a, it was a one way trip. I can still remember that old sergeant, he was a World War I type and, and getting pretty, uh, you know, getting pretty old, but he was still in the Army. And when we marched out of there, he was crying. He wanted to go too. Texas Aggies served in every theater and on every major battlefield of World War II. Back at home, the campus was once again converted to a military training facility. The nation was in need. Once again, Texas A&M was called and simply answered, here. In April of 1942, U.S. forces had been squeezed into a little island called Corregidor that's in Manila Bay. And some Aggies in the tunnel decided that they would recognize muster and get together. And so what they did is they passed around a sheet and everybody that they could find signed their name to the list. There was a reporter in the tunnel from one of the news services and they wrote this story about the muster. That story, the Army let this reporter broadcast off the island. And so it got back home and lo and behold, there are the names of the Aggies. And so the people, the relatives, know that their sons and husbands are on Corregidor and they were still alive at that moment. Fifteen days after the Aggies sent the message, the island of Corregidor fell. Commanded by Major General George F. Moore, class of 1908, all U.S. forces were either captured or killed. In this hallowed soil lie the mortal remains of many men who here died that liberty might live. Among the bravest of these brave are 20 officers, sons of Texas A&M unable themselves to answer this year's annual muster. It is for us, therefore, to do so for them, to answer for them in clear and firm voice. They stood steadfast, unyielding and unafraid through those dark days of our country's gravest peril, and by inspiring example helped point the way. Douglas MacArthur. In June 1944, another Aggie was about to see extraordinary service. James Earl Rudder, class of 32, was the commanding officer of the 2nd Ranger Battalion. During the D-Day invasion of Omaha Beach, Rudder was given an impossible task. Fight through enemy fire, climb the 10-story cliffs of Point du Hoc, and outflank the enemy. Rudder's Rangers climbed the slopes under intense fire and took the German guns that pinned down Allied forces. For two days, the Rangers defended the positions against wave after wave of enemy counterattack. Half of the Ranger Battalion did not survive the assault, and Rudder himself was wounded twice in the engagement. The contribution of Texas Aggies in World War II cannot be measured. During the war, Texas A&M contributed more officers than West Point. Aggies were at Pearl Harbor when the war began, and in 1945, when the Japanese surrendered on the deck of the USS Missouri, Tom Dooley, class of 35, was there to watch. While that treaty was being signed, the first Allied tank rolled into Tokyo. Painted on the side were the words, we've never been licked. Anytime you mention our military history, the first thing anybody says is World War II. It is the finest hour.